Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Thomas Gernet, an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. And this presentation is in collaboration with uh, Chen Ji Ma, uh, one of my PhD students who worked on some of the modeling we are going to, to discuss. So the presentation is on modeling of uh, composite floors developing tensile membrane action. And in particular, we want to discuss modeling of large scale fire tests. So the presentation will cover three uh, items. We will discuss general modeling technique to model tensile membrane action in composite floors. Then we will discuss the modeling of the Ulster fire test that was conducted in 2010. And finally, we will discuss ongoing work on modeling of NIST fire tests that were uh, recently conducted. First, so tensile membrane action, uh, we are looking at composite steel concrete floors. We have steel beams supporting a composite deck with steel deck and concrete board on, on the top. There are reinforcement bars in, embedded in the concrete and then studs for the composite action. And in a prescriptive design, typically uh, all the steel beams would be fire protected. But when we want to leverage tensile membrane action in a performance-based fire design, we can leave central beams unprotected. So the peripheral beams that uh, surround the panel and bridge between the columns are protected, but central beams are left without protection. Then in a fire, those central beams get very hot, very fast. So they deflect, the, um, the steel leg is unprotected. There are large displacements of the slab as well. And with these large deflections, the, the reinforcement bars in the slab uh, get put in tension and, and start uh, really resisting additional loads. So the loads have been transferred uh, really into a new load carrying mechanism with the steel bars in tension in the central zone of the slab and a compression ring that develops in the slab. So this is an alternate load pass in large displacement. Now this system, has been uh, studied and demonstrated since the 1990s. It has been used in the design of actual buildings uh, already, so buildings that have been built. And generally, it's considered that about half of the uh, steel beams can be left with no thermal protection uh, when taking advantage of that system. So to design a composite structure with tensile membrane action, there are some uh, simplified methods that are applicable in specific situations. Today, we are going to uh, discuss numerical modeling and advanced modeling. So that remains very important uh, to better understand the behavior, to prepare and analyze experiments or to develop simple methods, uh, run parametric analysis. So or whenever in a design, we are in a non-traditional situation, uh, Maybe the geometry is not regular or other, other reasons. So to model a structure in fire, as in general, it's a three-step process. We need a model for the fire action, model for the heat transfer uh, to compute the thermal response of the structure, and then the model for the, the structural response. And specifically, if we think about a composite floor exposed to fire and, and working in tensile membrane action, they are different failure modes that can uh, develop. So such floor can fail by excessive tension in the slab with rupture of the, of the rebars. And that would uh, show up as a, a large crack developing transversally in the slab. There can be failure through excessive compression and crushing in the slab, bending in the edge beams, uh, integrity failure, flame leak, uh, problems in the connections, in the shear studs, and so on. So when we think about those and the, the global behavior that we want to capture in general in the model, we want a numerical model that captures the fire, thermal, and structural response. We will use a certain type of elements to represent longitudinal members. So we have beams in that floor systems. We have other type of elements for uh, planar floor members. The model needs to capture large displacements, obviously, as well as temperature dependent material properties. And the material models need to be relatively sophisticated because the stress temperature paths are, are complex in those structures. Now, moving on to the modeling of the Ulster fire test, which was a large scale fire test aimed at studying tensile membrane action. So that test was conducted in 2010 in, in Ulster 
as part of a project uh, funded by the Research Fund for Coal and Steel, led notably by Olivier Vassal at Arsene Metal, and the test was led by Alina Jai at Ulster University. The compartment was 15 meter by nine meter. One specificity is that the structure uh, used cellular steel beams. And in the structure, you can see on the lower right picture, so the peripheral beams were protected, but the two central cellular steel beams were not protected in order to develop tensile membrane action. It was a wood creep fire test with a relatively uh, significant fuel load of 700 megajoules per square meter, and the structure was loaded also with mechanical load. The test went uh, very well in the sense that well, a severe fire developed with flashover and there were temperature of up to about 2000 degrees C in the compartment, it was a relatively long fire. And in terms of the structural response, tensile membrane action developed and the structure survived until, until burnout, which was uh, the objective of the test. You can see a few pictures of the, the experiment here. You see very large residual uh, deflections. Well, first of all, large displacement during the fire, but also large residual deformations of this floor that deflected as a membrane. The central beams exhibited web post buckling, which was also expected for these cellular beams subjected to fire. So when this instability mode appears, the, the lower T's, the lower flanges, but they do not uh, contribute anymore to, to the structural resistance. But nevertheless, the, the slab, the composite slab, resisted owing to tensile membrane action. For the modeling, so we actually modeled this test before the test was conducted in order to inform uh, the design and study what, what would happen, and then uh, again to, to post-process the, the, the results. So the modeling of the fire was uh, performed with the software Ozone, the zone uh, fire model. Then we ran Saphir thermal analysis to get the temperature elevation in the members and the structural analysis. So you see that different types of uh, structural members were, were studied. We have protected beams, the central unprotected beams, the slab, and then in the structural model, all those members are uh, assembled and are considered when evaluating the structural response. So a couple of uh, specific considerations in this, in this model. Uh, I mentioned that the cellular beam exhibited web post buckling. Now, if we want to explicitly capture this behavior, we would need a shell model and uh, it is possible and it has been done in other projects to represent and predict the web post buckling in cellular beams with shells in Saphir. But here, when focusing on the whole structural system, we wanted a more efficient approach. We wanted beam finite elements. So first of all, the beam, the steel beam profile, uh, we modeled only the upper T and the lower T. We did, we did not model the web because longitudinally the stresses cannot travel through uh, the, the, the voids, the, the holes. And then when web post buckling develops, what happens is that we lose basically the lower T. So to capture that in a simplified way, we implemented a specific material model called a steel WPB for web post buckling. This steel material follows the law of Eurocode 3 up to 500 degrees C. And then between 500 degrees C and 600 degrees C, the mechanical properties reduce to zero. So basically, we know that's when web post buckling will, will happen. We know it from previous studies or with shell elements. And so we prescribe this uh, loss at that temperature. Another modeling aspect, this is the composite slab. So in reality, the, the composite floor is a rather complex structural system. We have a, a corrugated steel deck. We have uh, the concrete, we have the studs. And in the model, we use shell finite elements which have constant thickness. So this is also a, a, simplify, a simplifying assumption or a modeling consideration. So the way the slab is modeled is that for the structural response, first of all, we are completely neglecting the steel deck, which is unprotected, will get very hot and may delaminate. So we are only relying on the concrete. And for the structural response, we model only the part of the concrete that is above the ribs, because again, our element has constant thickness, so it goes in both directions. So we uh, can only rely on that, on that part. However, for the thermal response, we do consider some thickness of thermal concrete or an effective thickness to capture the, the effect of what's in the ribs. This uh, shell element is 
combined with beam elements in the structural model. The beam and the shell share the same node, so we assume full composite action there. And of course, we adjust the, their vertical position with the node line to match. It's possible to use different approaches again, and others such as uh, Professor Quill's team have used models where they explicitly model the studs. So in this specific application of the modeling of the Ulster test, it was deemed not necessary, but again, this, this can be uh, used in other applications. So here are the results for the sake of time, just showing final uh, vertical deflections at the center of this composite floor during the test. You see that we got a good agreement between the, the experimental test and the SAFIA model. So this uh, good agreement in terms of overall vertical deflection at mid-span, they reflect an agreement basically from the fire model to the temperatures in the sections and, and in the structural response. What we see also in this deflection trend is uh, very clearly at, at first we have low deflections and the floor is acting is in bending. And then once we get the web post buckling of the cellular steel beams and the heating of those unprotected beams, we get an acceleration in the, in the deformations. And that's when we activate tensile membrane action once the deflection is large enough. And there uh, we get um, a stabilization in the in the in the displacement. Then the fire cools down, and we get a, a stabilization overall with a lot of residual deflection, which we observed on the picture. Where the floor basically at the end had uh, still seventy centimeters of uh, of deflection at the center. In Safia, we can plot the membrane forces in the shell elements to observe where we have compression and tension, and and we see very clearly this transition from a bending mode where the concrete shell, concrete slab is mostly in compression, working with the steel beams, transition to a membrane mode on the right with this uh, very ni nice tensile zone and compression ring. And this is the deformed shape at the end. So we do not have time to cover all the details of the models, but just a note on the concrete material model. Uh, if you look at what's happening in uh, at integration point in, in those shell elements, uh, in terms of stress temperature path, this is relatively complex with some reversals. So the concrete will start in compression, go through tension uh, during the fire, and then come back to compression. So in Saphir, the, the model combines plasticity and damage. And for the damage, we use different damage values in tension and compression, which allows capturing uh, the crack closure effect, basically, when the, the steel beam come back a little bit and there is compression in, in the concrete, you will have a, a regain in stiffness and that is captured uh, in the model. Okay, moving on now to the NIST fire test. So recently the NIST conducted three large scale experiments on uh, steel concrete structures. The objective was also to study the behavior of the composite floors. In those compartments of fire exposed structure, there was one central steel beam. And one interesting aspect of those experiments is that they constructed a full two-story, two by three base uh, structure actually, where one bay or one part is subjected to the fire, but you have the surrounding structure that provides some restraint and that is asymmetric. The fire followed the ASTME 119 time temperature curve, and they ran three tests, which vary in steel reinforcement and in protection of the central beam. So the first test, was according to prescriptive design with the central with all being protected and a very low amount of reinforcement basically just the shrinkage reinforcement of 60 square millimeter per meter and then we'll focus also on test three which was designed to develop tensile membrane action so uh, they omitted the protection of the central steel beam but used more steel reinforcement because now the steel reinforcement becomes structural to take the tensile membrane action so in test one, it was actually observed. So here you see a figure, uh, so plan view from the top of the exposed part. Okay, with the there is one central steel beam there going from left to right, and what was observed was that there was an early integrity failure. Although that specific assembly is uh, qualified for two hours of fire resistance, there was a la large crack opening at about seventy minutes and a, a rupture of the wire reinforcement in the slab. So the minimum shrinkage reinforcement appears insufficient 
uh, even when the beam is protected, but when we look at uh, the full-scale structural system response. Now in test three, so uh, recall that this is the one for tensile membrane action where the central steel beam is unprotected and um, there is more reinforcement. This floor developed tensile membrane action successfully. It achieved two hours of fire resistance. Then the ASTM fire was continued for a little bit further and they started to have a, a crack appear and then they, they stopped the test or the gas burners were shut off at 142 minutes. So here are the deflections and you see uh, test three as initially more deflection than test one because central beam is unprotected, so it goes into membrane. But then at two hours, it, it, uh, it is still resisting whether test one was, was uh, stopped earlier. Okay, now I'd like to hand it over to Chenji, who will describe the modeling of those two NIST fire tests. Okay, in previous slides, Professor uh, Thomas introduced the Austria test and the NIST test. So right now I'm going to introduce the uh, modeling strategy for the NIST test. So uh, firstly, we use the temperature dependent thermal property to provide a uh, accurate uh, temperature estimation at a high temperature level. Also, the effective thickness based on your code is adopted. On the right side, uh, we compared a uh, fault temperature between the simulation and test for test number one. So on uh, in the first finger, here we can see the temperature in a uh, shallow section is much higher than the deep section at the rebound location. And the sphere can predict uh, a good estimation. This value is almost the average uh, temperature of the um, shallow section and the deep section at the reinforcement uh, location. Uh, we also compare the slab top uh, temperature. There is a good agreement uh, for steel beams. We select three different uh, locations to compare their temperature and also uh, Sophia successfully predict the temperature. Here uh, for the uh, mechanical analysis, we built the whole Flow system, including the unexposed slabs. The temperature for the unexposed slab and the column are set as ambient temperature. And also for the uh, steel reinforcement, uh, we use class A steel, which means uh, the, uh, at the maximum um, plastic string, the string is about uh, 5%. Uh, we uh, compared the uh, displacement between the simulation and test. Generally, the simulation can predict, uh, uh, provide a good agreement on the overall displacement uh, response. At 107 minutes in the test, the fire load and the mechanical load was removed, which, uh, and here we can see in the finger up to the pink line, the comparison between the test and simulation may not be applicable because in the simulation, we didn't remove the mechanical uh, load. And the simulation for test number one stops at around 140 minutes due to the steel in descending branch. Uh, so here uh, we, we believe that the steel in descending branch can reflect the steel failure in actual test. We uh, compared the damage uh, crack pattern on the exposed lab between the test and the simulation. Uh, in Sapphire for each cell element, uh, there are 32 uh, integration point across different signals and the different location. So the finger here, uh, take the average of the 33 integration point. And uh, here we can see generally Sapphire can successfully predict the sequence of the crack initiation. For example, uh, at uh, 41 minutes in test, the cracks become visible around the slab edge and uh, it was also uh, realized in uh, Sophia. We also captured the uh, failure of uh, steel rebars. Here we can see in test uh, the ruptured uh, steel rebars country around the secondary beam and the slab edge. And in simulation, we can see the steel failure country uh, above the secondary beam and the north of the slab edge. Uh, compared with the average damage value, the maximum damage value may affect the uh, cracking situation much better. So here we can see at 
69 minutes, the damage distribution in Sapphire is almost the same as the crack pattern in test observation. In next slides, we compare the displacement between uh, for test three, similar to test number one, there's a good agreement. Sapphire successfully predict the two hour fire rating and uh, there's no um, rebuff failure observed in the simulation of test number three. In next slides, we compared the damage and uh, between test number one and test number three. In test number one, the uh, secondary beam are protected and uh, here we can see there is significant uh, damage concentration around the secondary beam. And in test number three, uh, the second beam is unprotected and the damage is more uh, distributed uh, along the exposed slab. And uh, in test number one, a uh, steel failure was observed but not uh, found in test number three. So in, in summary, we showed modeling of the Ulster test and this test, which were full scale fire test of composite structures. And we showed good agreement with the, the modeling with, with Sapphire, with the, the technique discussed. There are more tests that have been conducted on the composite membrane action, and we can look at the, the design parameters for all those tests. And in fact, so this shows that tensile membrane action can be activated to support the loads, and there is lots of experimental evidence that it can be robust. Of course, some conditions have to be fulfilled, and with the NIST test number one, we showed the effect of having too low reinforcement, even if the beam was protected in, in that case. But there has been also an example of test uh, in Czech Republic, in Moxcrow test, where they were really looking at the limit cases and using very uh, little reinforcement, they were thin slab, and they reached a failure during the test. So to conclude, uh, in this presentation, we presented numerical finite element models to capture the behavior of composite steel concrete floor systems in fire. Those models need to be relatively sophisticated to take into account shell and beams, large displacements, and, and, and take into account properly the material models. But we discussed also some pragmatic simplifying assumptions. And we found that the, the models can capture the behavior observed during the test, including in one case, a, a failure with structure of, of rebar. So in one case, there was a achievement of, of failure and that was captured as well. So those composite structures may exhibit various failure modes in fire. And of course, it's always important when doing numerical modeling to remember or to notice which failure modes are not covered by the model. And this needs to be addressed uh, as needed separately. So to conclude, we'd like to acknowledge the support of the NIST for this project. And with that, I conclude this presentation and I welcome your questions. Thank you. So I'm looking at the chat to get to the questions. So there's a question from Ali. Thank you, Ali. Uh, without the web in the model, how did you model the horizontal shear transfer between the top and bottom T of the beam at lower temperatures? Thank you. So because of the, the fact that the beam finite element is a Bernoulli type beam element, actually, when you're using the fiber beam elements in Sapphire, it's not a problem to have uh, a hole in the in the cross section or a discontinuity because the strain field is based on the Bernoulli assumption. So those beam finite elements have a uniaxial material model, right? With a, only the longitudinal stress. Uh, yes. So there was a discussion or a question about the damage that are plotted in the shell finite elements. There are four integration points over the surface of the shell. Then the user can decide the number of integration points across the thickness. It can go up to 10. Usually we recommend going to 8, 9, or 10, or having sufficient integration point across the thickness, especially if there will be uh, some, some bending that develops. So in changes model, you used 8 across the thickness and 4 over the surface, so that's 32. So in initial elements, we read 32 values for internal parameters, such as the damage. So whenever we plot this result or other similar results, we have to decide uh, which one to pick. So if you want the damage in a shell, do we take the maximum across those 32 points or do we take the average value of another statistically meaningful representation? So here we looked at both the average and the maximum to get a sense of uh, where to expect those uh, large cracks. And we, we showed some of those in the presentation. So a related question to quantify the damage, what response is it based on? So here the damage is really the 
internal parameter in the concrete constitutive model. So this is a variable that varies between zero and one. One is when it is fully damaged. And this is based on the, the stress state and the plasticity and damage model that is incorporated in SAFIN. So there is one damage scalar in tension and one damage scalar in compression. Both vary from zero to one. And that's what we, we plotted through a MATLAB script uh, in some of the plots that we've shown here. I think I went through the question, or at least most of them, and I see that also we are hitting the time. So I'm going to stop here with the questions. And to conclude and close this day, I just want again to thank, first of all, all the speakers who have prepared a really great presentations covering a, a, an excellent range of applications. We had buildings, we had tunnels, bridges, we had different materials. Uh, steel, concrete, but also timber. So that was really uh, extremely interesting. At least I really enjoyed seeing all those different applications and those different modeling techniques. I want to thank also all the participants. Thank you very much for attending and for your participation, for your questions. Thank you very much all. Have a great weekend and thank you for using Safin.